sure that you have followed the unions in, in what press coverage you get in this country. We've seen that the, the Baker's Union has been quite busy of late with a number of campaigns and all the ground issues like zero hours contracts, fast food workers, working with youth and um, justice for all. And that's what Ian is going to talk to you about initially. So I'll hand over to Ian straight away. Thank you. It's a pleasure to, to be invited to, uh, to Hazard to, to speak to you. I think most, most health and safety reps would say this is probably the most prestigious event in the health and safety reps calendar. And, you know, I would also like to, to pass on, on behalf of our executive and on behalf of the members of the Bakers Food and Allied Workers Union. Really, our congratulations and, and obviously our, our sincere thanks to, to Hilda Palmer and all those people involved in Hazards and all of the activists up and down the country that take part in it on a daily basis that made sure that health and safety has been kept on everybody's agenda right across the country. Because I think without, without the likes of Hazards, I think what would have happened is, is those profiteers would have been able to, been able to go at will and, and take even more, even more of our legislation away. So I congratulate the work that Hazards has done and obviously I congratulate the work that all of its campaigns have, have been able to, to keep health and safety uh, on everybody's agenda. I think, I think there's lots and lots of different issues and this, this weekend there's lots and lots of people talking about many, many issues that are so relevant to health and safety and poverty is a key issue around health and safety, you know, the, what's happening in the workplace is a key issue, zero hours are a key issue. So there's, there's quite a few subjects that's going to be talked about over this, um, over this weekend and I, I think some of, the, some of the stuff that's going on politically and some of the stuff that's going on in workplaces and up, up and down the country is important to, to discuss as well. I mean, we're living in a country where apparently the political mainstream is, is that food banks are acceptable and to be welcomed in the community, where, where it's okay for people to have to go to, to a lot of countries like Wonga to be able to afford to live, and apparently that's, that's seen as, as, as okay for working people, that's acceptable now. That's, that's what politicians and the media want us to believe. It's okay for that to be, to be happening to, to ordinary working class people. Well, I believe we deserve better than that. I believe, I believe we should be demanding more. I believe that we have an opportunity, and our movement's an amazing opportunity. I think the working class sometimes you know, forget the power that it has. And I want to talk about those things this morning, those areas where the labour movement has achieved so, so many things in our country. Because when we fight, and when we stand together, we do win, and I want to tell you a few stories. I mean, for, for example, you know, anybody heard about the homeless dispute? I mean, mm. the homeless dispute was an inspiration, it was, it was fought in William. And, and what happened at the homeless dispute was, is that the company came along and said, due to, due to uh, a lost order, they were going to have to make some, 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 uh, some redundancies. A lot of members decided that they didn't want their mates to go down the road, so they did a deal. They did a deal with the company, and they cut their hours, and they cut the pay to save people's jobs. And they voted on it, and overwhelmingly, our members supported that approach, rather than their workmates, their work colleagues being sent down the road. But the company then came back after they'd, they'd done this agreement, and our members had made those changes and said, sorry, it's not, it's not enough. We now we need to make some more changes and we'll have to announce some redundancy. So unfortunately, a number of people were made redundant. But it was absolutely nothing to do with our service. It was all about profit. All about profit, because 48 hours after those people had finished their work on the Friday, 48 hours on the Sunday, they marched in 24 0 contract workers and agency workers. Because that's what it was about. It was about getting rid of full-time workers to bring down the pay in, in that company. So they could, they could make sure that their profits would increase, not through new business, but through cuts to workers' terms and conditions. Because that's what it's all about. That's their profit. That's how they're gaining more and more cash. They're gaining more and more cash at our expense. But those people in women said, you know what? We don't think that's right. We don't think it's fair that people, that people should have to work alongside us and be on less terms and conditions, so we're not going to just stand by and accept that. So the company said, well, it's just tough, look, you're just going to have to get used to it, you're just going to have something you can do, we're, we're the management, you're the workers, what can you do? So I remember said, well, tell me what we'll do. We'll do what, we, what workers should always do, which will show solidarity with those people who are going to be exploited. And they had a meeting, they had a number of meetings with the company, but the top and bottom of the world, they held a meeting, and they got a mandate, and they decided they were going to take industrial action. And the company said to him, tell you what, take industrial action, we'll shut the factory. 
And I hope I understand that, so shut the fact up, because I'll tell you what, if you think we're going to allow you to run in this town, in our town, second class workers, think again. We're not going to accept second class workers in Wigan or in our bakery. And they were right to do that. They were right to tell the company and to say to them, you ain't going to bully us into submission. We ain't going to accept. We ain't going to accept that you will bully us into accepting people being paid less than us. So our members went out on strike. And the interesting thing about that was, in that workplace there was 180 full-time employees, all trade union members, and 24 zero-hours contract people, trade union members. And on the first day of the strike, there was 204 pickets, 24 zero-hour contract workers, and 180 people that worked in the factory on a full-time basis, stood side by side on that picket line day one. The company said, you're going to lose a fortune, we're never going to give in. We're never going to give in, we're never going to concede. Tell you what, after saying all those things to us, telling us what they were going to do to the factory, telling us how they weren't going to give in and our members would lose, on the Friday, they called us to a meeting and they said, look, 24 zero hour contract workers will make them permanent workers. And they made 24 zero hour con contract workers permanent workers on the same conditions as everybody else in the factory. No second class workers in the world. That's how we win. And the company said, well now you can come back to work. And our members said, we remember the last bargain we dealt with you and you, you let us down. So we ain't gonna, we ain't gonna cave in so easy. Now we're expecting you to do a deal with the agency workers. No agency worker on a zero hours contract. No agency worker working alongside us on less terms and conditions than us. And the company said, but we don't employ you. They said, no, you engage them. So we're going to go out and strike on the second week unless you agree. Same terms and conditions for agency workers. And the company said, you're mad. You ain't going to do that. Your members aren't going to go out and strike for agency workers. Well, I'll tell you what, they offered our members a thousand pound each to cross the picket line. And our members said this, they said, you see that, you know, we are going to be skinned. We are going to cost us 500 quid a week. For each week of strike, it costs us 500 quid a week. And a thousand pound would be really welcome in our house. But you know what, you're going to scab forever, so I'm not going to take your money. I'm going to stand on the picket line because I'd rather have a few weeks of living in poverty than be an ever, 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 ever be a scab. And when Mark Harding stood on his picket line and told people who crossed it that they were scabs, he was absolutely right. You never cross the picket line, you stand in solidarity with your workers. And I mean, that is an important, important message because I'll tell you what happened. Because they didn't take the money, because they stood out on strike, because they stood together, because they refused the company's money, on the second week of that action, the company came back and said, you see your agency workers, every single one of them will be on the same terms and conditions, no second class worker in Wigan, no second class agency worker, all on the same terms and conditions. And that's an important message because that's an inspirational fight. And that shows that workers, when they stand together, they can win. It's the same message we should take when they talk to us about the pay, the pay issue in this country. It's the same message when they attack our, our safety rights. It's the same message that we should turn around and tell them when they say that we're going to bring workfare into a workplace. It's the same message when they say they're going to treat people differently and worse than how they will treat this person here. We should never allow ourselves to let people treat people differently. We should always stand together and we should always fight together. And I'll tell you this as well, I'll tell you this as well, because workfare, workfare is an horrendous skin. Workfare should be abolished, it's a bother. In the 1870s, because that's where this government was taken us back to, we had the workhouse. Well, let me tell you today, anybody, anybody that's forced to work under the threat of losing their pay, under the threat of being sanctioned so they can't pay the rent and can't buy the food, that is enforced labour, and in any language, that is slavery. And so I'm really, really pleased that our trade union has a clear policy on workfare. And that is you bring your skins into our workplaces, and we will go out on strike. Because that's how you deal with workfare. And let's be clear. Let's be clear. It keeps them out. And when the TUC did that joint statement the other week with the CBI, we condemned that statement outright. It was against TUC policy. It shouldn't, it shouldn't have been done by the TUC. They should be fighting for people's rights. It's no good marching against austerity and then doing deals because it looks good with the CBI and the IOD. 
It's absolutely a bomber, and they should be condemned and rightly so at every trade by every trade union at the TUC next week. Because they're not speaking on our behalf, they're absolutely not speaking on any, any unemployed person's behalf, they're not speaking on anybody with any disabilities, with injuries or, or sickness, whether it's caused from work or caused from any other reason. They're not speaking on anybody's behalf. People should go to work and they should earn a living. And they shouldn't just have to earn a living, you know, they should have a living that makes them able to live with dignity. I don't know if anybody's seen anything about the fast food campaign, but the fast food campaign is highlighting what's actually happening on the streets of the United Kingdom. A lot of people don't realise that the fast food industry has been the testing ground for years, for years, of all the practices that you're now seeing probably in your workplace. The first year I was contract came into McDonald's in 1980. That's when the first year I was contract came in. The first, the first youth-related minimum wage issues before the youth minimum wage existed, happened in the fast food industry. That's where all of these initiatives came from. And we say this, we say it's time to demand our fair share, it's to, time to demand better for all working people. It's time work, working people have the opportunity to live and work with dignity. So let's demand, let's demand a living wage which takes five million people out of poverty. Let's demand a minimum wage that doesn't say, well, it's acceptable that you might not be able to fund your children's birthday party or pay for family holiday. Let's demand a wage where people don't have to, on a week-by-week -week basis, have to explain what poverty they're living in. Let's say to the government, we want a minimum wage of a minimum of £10 an hour for every worker in this country. And you say, it is, it's not, it's not feasible, it's not, it's not possible. Look at what's happening in America. Look at Seattle, $15 an hour, said it wasn't possible there. They told us at Hovis it wasn't possible. They told people all the time it's not possible. But when we come together, we're an amazing group of people. We're an unbelievable group of people. The power of us is incredible. Because, I mean, Helder said last night, there is more of us than there is them. You know, the reality is there is. We can put pressure on. We can make, we can make things happen. And you only have to look at our history. We ended inequality. We brought in the rights for men to vote, the right for women to vote, the creation of the NHS, the welfare state which is being dismantled. We created that. We, the working class, created that. And it wasn't because the politicians gave it us, it was because we made the politicians listen to us and accept they had to change. And that's why it's important now that we come together as a working class movement and say we demand better. We demand an end to inequality in any workplace and one which is based on age, that should be scrapped too. No longer should a worker based on their age be stopped from earning the same as the person who are working alongside. So we're calling for the scrapping of the youth minimum wage. Why is it acceptable that that is okay. It's inequality, it's unequal, and it's unfair, and it's unjust. And we're asking people, we're asking people of you and the team you've seen next week to support that call, to support the team you've seen, the motions that we've got before the team you've seen, that demands the team you've seen campaigns for a £10 an hour, and demands the, the team you've seen calls for the abolition of the youth minimum wage. We're also asking, we're also asking people to come together, and, and when, you know, we always allow, we always allow the people at the top of our, our establishment to decide what the ground is that we're going to fight on. And you know, one of the problems has been, is that's led to the attacks on our amazing public sector workers. Our amazing public sector workers have had their pay cut, they've had their pensions frozen, they've been told they've got to work longer, can get less, and they've been told that this is all because they were responsible for the crisis. And then what we did as a movement is we went and marched against austerity. Well, I'll tell you what we should have marched against. We should have marched against the greedy bastards who stole all the money. And that's what we should have done. And the march should have been called, let's change the language. That's what we should have been marching And what we have to do is going to be supporting this, 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 uh, this march in October. And we welcome the fact that the TUC is organising the march because it is important. But we're also saying, we're also saying, never mind Britain needs to pay rise. Britain needs a general strike. That's bringing this whole damn government down. Because when we do, when we do, and we force them to listen to us, we can have a society that's fit for us all, and that means a society which is fair, equal, and where people have uh, the ability to live with dignity. And I just want to finish on this note, because you, health and safety reps are essential. I want to talk to our health and safety reps, so I have to say to them, 
You know, the most important thing in any workplace is health and safety. The most important thing that we do as a trade union is to look after people's health and safety. Because it doesn't matter whether I, whether I get you a massive pay increase, if you haven't got the health or the ability to enjoy it, then what's the point of it? So I congratulate all the works that you do. I congratulate everything that Hazard does. And I just want to say thank you for listening to me, Solidarity. <laughs> Uh, works for the European Trade Union Institute, has done since 2008, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, she's a lawyer by training, uh, but she works as the head of the uh, Centre for Working Conditions and Health and Safety at the ETUI, uh, specialising in nanotechnologies and also in sustainable technologies and development is of our interest. But today she's going to talk on the theme of regulation and particularly about the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which is quite a sinister move which is happening at the moment, but not enough people know about it, so over to Aida. Thank you very much. Andrew, thank you very much. This is my second year at Hazard, so I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, I really congratulate you, all of you, for your hard work being here and for all the years. And uh, this time I have some news from, uh, from Brussels uh, concerning the Transatlantic uh, Trade Investor Partnership that I'm sure you have already heard about that and our union worries. So, uh, today I would like to go through uh, several points. First, just to summarize very briefly the position that the European Trade Union has taken on that. And uh, secondly, I would like to explain why uh, the TTIP, as we call it, is kind of a, a deregulation de instrument in, in disguise. And I will show you how in practice it can, can work in Europe or in the US if it happens. I think that it will happen in any case because negotiators in Europe and in the US are very keen and there is a, there's lots of, uh, um, of worries uh, from the civil society and in spite of that we think that the, the, the trade agreement will, will happen in any case. So um, the, the, what the ETUC thinks about this is um, well, all, it all started in 2013 formally, although some negotiations have been done informally here and there between the two sides of the Atlantic. And, uh, but last year a draft was adopted formally. It was negotiated between only uh, the Commission and the US uh, partners without the uh, formal consultation of the social partners or other uh, civil society organizations. And uh, the ETUC expressed serious concerns from the beginning because the draft and the documents were kept closely in a private discussions and uh, no transparency was no transparency no transparency was made uh, um, on the terms of the negotiating mandate and the trade unions and the civil society expressed it to the European Commission but very little attention was paid to that. Um, we think that the economic scale of such agreement will have negative consequences in all the, the, in, for globally, for Europe, for the United States, and, and for other parts of the of the, of the, of the world. And uh, the ETUC has identified several challenges. First, that it will diminish labor rights and environmental protection, and there is a clear statement that some uh, issues should not be part of such an agreement. It would be a little bit technical now, but I will try to explain as best as possible. Firstly, the investor state dispute settlement, which is a clause in the treaty that allows companies to sue national authorities or governments. This should be according to the ETUC and to my understanding as well, completely excluded from the treaty. Public services also, and uh, audiovisual, cultural, cultural <coughs> services as well, agriculture, and other liberalization of financial services. The, ETUT, the ETUC was clear on that, and these type of things shouldn't be part of the agreement. Now, the TTIP, why is it the regulation in, the, in disguise? Because in order to leverage the level of competitiveness among the two uh, 
partners, the EU and the US, we need to come into a common ground. Normally in Europe there are tighter rules concerning health and safety and the environment and other, and other fields. And the US perhaps is not so much uh, uh, tighter, but our uh, expert in the US perhaps can, or can, can give more information on that. So how can we aim to have a good trade uh, treaty if the regulations are very difficult? Well, now the idea of the European Union would be to analyze the whole set of the EU acquis, legislative acquis, and try to make them fit for purpose. Or, in other words, to reduce what it is administrative burden. So, so that the, both sides of the Atlantic will be able to trade freely uh, the goods and other stuff. And the objective is called for policies which include regulatory coherence, meaning these sexy words are very difficult to understand when we ask the, the, the different uh, commissioners what do you mean by the regulatory coherence is by making the law the laws more compatible and reducing costs for both sides of the Atlantic and for companies as such. This is also means that the transatlantic marketplace um, would need to, uh, to deregulate uh, health and safety and environment both uh, in, the, in, the, in the EU we have 24 directives plus a framework directive which are already under revision, which are quite, quite good in my opinion, although they only set minimum standards. And for this, uh, it's not the case in the, in the, uh, in the, in the US. How a co regulation, uh, regulatory coherence will, will be achieved then? It will be by cooperating in areas that will bring efficiency and cost saving to the operators and better profitability and develop transparency. Eliminating tariffs in all the sectors, reducing costs, all necessary costs according to them, but there is no serious criteria of what type of costs should be eliminated. Also, they would like to establish mechanisms for future progress which, again, we don't really understand what that means, <coughs> and continue regulatory cooperation where appropriate. If the Commission or the US authorities think that in some fields should be a regulatory uh, agreement, it, it can happen, but it, it can happen. So, all of these lists are the, uh, the, the wish list of the negotiators, which is not really understandable <coughs> what they say, and we don't really, we don't really know what is all behind. Now, I just would like to bring a couple of examples. Why health and safety, and how health and safety is going to be um, impact if the TTIP takes place? I would like to show the, the case for the chemical industry, and uh, it's clear from the mandate that the EU and the US would like to enhance regulatory compatibility in various sectors, pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, pesticides, ICT, ICT, automobiles and chemicals. Now, in Europe we have the so-called regulation REACH, which regulates uh, all the chemical substances registered in Europe. Uh, it's very new, it's only less than 10 years uh, old, and on the contrary, in the US we have the TASC regulation, which states all, all in 40 years ago, 1976. Both regulations are pretty, pretty much <coughs> undergoing. Just as an example, the task allows chemicals to be put in the market without proof that they are safe. It's not up to the companies to prove that substances are safe. It's not updated. And it applies to 84,000 84, chemicals, but only allows 60,000 of them to be used under presumption of safety. If the authority thinks that a chemical is really unsafe, then they have to produce all the risk assessment and the chemical tests to prove themselves and to the companies that produces them that those chemicals are safe. So it's completely different from the EU approach. So, 
proven that a chemical is dangerous is up to the authority. And, of course, the authorities lack of resources and they are not able to conduct all the tests for all the chemicals that the U.S. companies produce. And, curiously, by 2010, only 1% of chemicals found in the U.S. have been tested, which is pretty sad. Now, what happens on this side of the Atlantic? We have REACH, which dates from 2007. It was a hard negotiation, but we think that it's a good regulation. Why? Because it puts the burden of the proof to the manufacturer of the substances. They have to, conduct, to produce a, 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 a huge uh, um, file to, to prove that the substance is safe. And if they, have to, if they don't provide the, mark, the data, the substance is not put into the market. This is the principle. No data, no market. It's embedded under the pin of the precautionary principle. And all the information, as I've said, is compiled in a, in a file, and the authority, the European authority, normally revises the file very often and requires to update the information or even extra tests or extra information, which is quite good. Risk assessment, contrary to the US, is mandatory. and well, now we have our questions here. If we have these really antagonic regulations, how will the TTIP deal with such conflicting set of laws? <coughs> will there be a way to bring together the two regulatory regimes? How? Now, another example. ISDS is a very technical uh, concept that is very difficult to understand. Investors still <coughs> Settlement. What it basically means is that the companies are able to, to sue governments. And uh, if in case they think that a law or an administrative resolution endangers their profits. So if in case the ISDS will be adopted on the TTIP, law, law, uh, companies may sue EU members, national authorities. And if we have protective rules concerning health and safety, which are more strict than the US counterparts, the US companies might be able to use these type of mechanisms to sue uh, national authorities. And of course, uh, then this will hamper the whole uh, sovereignty, sovereignty of, of the EU and the national authorities and the, and the protection of human health and the environment. And to illustrate this type of dangers, I have, I have brought to you a case. And there, this is not, the, not only the one case. We have several cases similar to this. <coughs> this case is Ethel Corp versus Canada. It happened in the framework of the NAFTA agreement, which is very nice to see because the NAFTA in the in US, Canada and Mexico showed how health and safety can be hampered. So, this company, Ethel, was producing a toxic casino additive produced in the US. And uh, for public sector reasons, the Canadian Parliament thought it would be important to ban it. And uh, it issued a resolution, it banned, and uh, the company reacted negatively. It sued the Canadian government using that the ISDS mechanism arguing that NAFTA provisions violated their profits and they asked for $251 million to cover the alleged losses. So after, um, you can see that it's very easy for companies just to, to, to raise up this ISDS and, uh, and then these kind of mechanisms or allegations are solved not in international courts but in arbitration panels. And uh, the arbitration panels are formed by, by, by people who are not uh, uh, public judges, but that might have links with uh, the industry or with the company itself. Um, the dangers of the ISDS mechanisms are, as, as is, uh, are obvious. Uh, the, the government might have to compensate in such amount of money to the private company, to 
Millions is not just a, a little amount. And uh, of course, it, it can always create uh, an intimidation to national governments to produce or to issue uh, protective laws. Domestic courts are completely bypassed by these international panel, arbitration panels and just private companies can, can drain the treasuries of the states. Just to wrap up what I have presented here, I would like to, to point out five conclusions. First, the first is that the deregulation is on the agenda. We see it in the UK, we see it heavily in Europe with the Refit program and the TTIP initiative, as, as, as others, is, is also dangerous for, for health and safety and the whole deregulatory agenda. Uh, we think that the, the, the exercise of the refit might just pave the way for the TTIP, TTIP to happen. Now, second thing is that there are still areas that are not yet into, in, in, on, on the regulation and we're trying to regulate it as, as best as possible, like nanomaterials, the, the endocrine disrupting the substances, shell gas, etc. We don't have laws for that here in Europe. So, it might be possible that these type of uh, areas might be subject of negotiation under the TTIP, which then won't be uh, perhaps uh, just not very well regulated. Third conclusion is that the EU uh, regulations on health and safety are being evaluated, as I mentioned before, under the REFIT program. So, if this if we're already going into this track, how can the TTIP ensure protection if it entails easy measures? <coughs> so, and for the regulatory initiatives might be seen as inhibiting profits and avoid any democratic debate. My fourth conclusion is that regulatory cooperation should focus on information exchange and commitment to international agreements without any regulatory commitments. And uh, this is it. Thank you very much for your attention. And I just wanted to bring the, uh, the, the, the concern that the TTIP is, uh, is a danger and the health and safety regulations that all negotiators are just avoiding are not being seen are the ones that are going to be the most concerned. Thank you very much. And we've got Nancy Lessing here, it's a great pleased to see Nancy is a, a member of United Steel Workers and Workers Unity, in, in, uh, which is a joint led to between United and United Steel Workers in the United States. And she works at the Tony Pesocci Centre for Health, Safety and Environmental Education at the moment. Previous to that, she's been doing health and safety with trade unions for over 35 years, about 1979. Previous to that, she was at Massachusetts Centre for Occupational Safety and Health, and she's been doing a lot of training of workers and workers' reps on health and safety issues across the world, uh, focusing very much on issues like behavioural safety campaigns, the blame the worker kind of approach which is going on in the States, and some of the other things that are happening now in terms of stress on workers because of extending orders, downsizing, and all the stuff that Ian was talking was about earlier this morning as well. So I'll hand you over to Nancy. I'm very pleased to see her here. Thanks, Nancy.
private sector, we are under 7% unionized. Uh, and and um, that has made the United States a laboratory uh, for concocting draconian work schemes uh, and exporting them. Um, but it is not let too late to heed this cautionary tale. I want to uh, begin with this slide. Uh, the caption says, I've never seen a tide rise like that before. Um, and uh, say, our biggest health and safety problem now uh, is the power imbalance between capital and labor. Uh, workers' health and lives now hang in this imbalance. Uh, so the challenge is about uh, building our power. The fundamental question that uh, we begin with is, what's happening in your workplace that's causing or contributing to your members who have been injured, made ill, or uh, stressed on the job? Um, what are those things? And I'll share with you the slide we did a survey at our last United Steelworkers Health and Safety Conference with a thousand delegates that came. And uh, this is the top ten list. Uh, lack of or inadequate training, downsizing or understaffing, production pressures or speed up, equipment not being properly maintained or repaired, discipline for injuries and safety or the employer just blaming workers, uh, increased workloads, intensification of work, job combinations, ergonomic hazards, heat, extended hours and days of work, we don't have your working hours legislation, uh, and the employer simply not addressing identified hazards. Um, with that, does that look familiar? Yeah. Anything there? <laughs> yes, unfortunately. Um, so uh, we say welcome to lead because that's what's going on. It's about employers wanting to do more work with less people. Um, in uh, over a decade ago, our research agency for occupational safety and health uh, studied work reorganization. Uh, and they uh, documented serious health and safety problems associated with lean production, downsizing, long hours of work, work pressures uh, and demands. Um, since then, our problems have grown. Uh, so too has the research documenting the problems. So why do these problems with work organization persist? And it is uh, <clears throat> because the key changes in the work process continue. And those key changes that we see are standardization of work or de-skilling, the intensification of work or the lean or the speed up, um, multitasking or job combinations are the nice word that employers like to use, flexibility. Um, Multi-skilling or job combinations, uh, oh, I did that one. Automation and new technologies. Um, monitoring, watching everything that you do all of the time and then outsourcing uh, or moving work. And this is all part of uh, management's uh, plan for reorganizing work. It started in the manufacturing industries um, with the Toyota production system. And actually, there's some research in the United States uh, that says it actually started in slavery, when uh, slave owners were monitoring slaves to try to speed them up. Um, so it goes back a long way to terrible things, but the Toyota production system in our modern uh, Day is, is what this uh, comes from, but it's spread out everywhere. We see it in the private sector, the public sector, it's in transport, uh, utilities, it's in construction, it's come into hospitals. There's been uh, um, periodicals, uh, journals that uh, say the Toyota production system comes to hospitals, how to do it in hospitals. Uh, so it's everywhere. Um, this is a quick picture. Uh, of something that might be called a self-directed work team. Um, and what you'll see in this picture is a customer and workers, and what you don't see is management. Because management is built into the system. Um, this is a system where we're pushing each other. Uh, we're stressed out and we hate each other. Uh, and uh, my, my partner, Charlie Richardson, who some of you met and, and who died last year, um, he had a test 
for these things that are called so-called to self-directed work teams or groups. He said, can they drop uh, tools and go fishing? And if the answer is no, then they are not self-directed. He said they are indirectly supervised work teams, again, because the, the uh, management is built into the process. So this is a picture um, of, of what this looks like, and, and the, each one of these uh, bars are people. And this is the, uh, what's called tack time, and this is, you know, a minute's worth of a cycle time. And with monitoring, uh, they're able to see who's doing what work. And all of the white space here is, uh, is uh, <clears throat> what's looked at as non-value added. The goal is to get rid of that non-value added. And so they're able to take 10 workers uh, with uh, these uh, rest breaks, and, and uh, that's what we need to recover and, and not get repetitive strain injury. Well, you take those 10 workers and you can put that work into seven people, all right? So that's downsizing. We have three that are working up to the tack time. We have some slackers here. And then this guy, <laughs> this guy, who's that? That is the boss's son. That is not the boss's son. That is the target. Because this the job didn't go from 10 to 7. They took this work, they put it here, here, and here, and he's gone. And so it was really 10 people to 6 people. Then the next thing they do, when everybody's working up to the tack time with uh, no downtime, they raise the bar. And so this is the race with no finish line. What we know about this, where they've been doing this the longest, is in Japan. They have two compensable occupational diseases that I want to mention. One is called Kiroshi. It's death from other overwork. Death from overwork. Your family gets compensated. Isn't that wonderful? Um, the other is, I believe, Karajitsu, which is suicide from overwork. It is a compensable disease in Japan. You commit suicide from overwork, and your family gets compensated. So this is just another picture of traditional model of uh, balancing where you say, okay, this doesn't look equal, we're going to make it so that everybody's working equally and has some downtime. In the lean model, you don't make it so everybody works equally and have downtime. You get rid of this person, have everybody work up to the maximum, and then you raise that line again. In terms of the flexibility, what we see, uh, there's different words used. Multi-skilling is the nice one. It's really multitasking, flexibility, job combinations. Operator maintenance, we don't need maintenance anymore. The operators can just do it. Um, and other duties as a sign, they're creating the jack of all trades, master of none. Automation is another trend that we see. And uh, you can think about your workplaces. Um, this may look familiar. This is NurseBot. It's a robot nurse. And this is an ATM for prescription medications. It's out on the streets in California. We don't need no pharmacists anymore. <coughs> Monitoring. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> because of the automation, they can monitor everything. So if you're in a mobile equipment and our mines and transport uh, and with fork uh, lifts and, and such, um, there's GPS. Um, <clears throat> this is an ankle bracelet used in house arrest in the United States. In one of our hospitals, an uh, employer came to the bargaining table wanting to put these on maintenance workers. <laughs> <laughs> smaller than a grain of rice, it goes under your skin. And then instead of having that bulky swipe card, you can just wave uh, your arm and, and uh, if, uh, if you're uh, so approved, the door will open. Um, the uh, inventor of that was uh, interviewed and the interviewer said, isn't this really going over the top now? Uh, and he said, actually, we monitor people this much anyway. It just makes it a little more convenient. This is being used in a workplace in Ohio, uh, in the United States, a non-union workplace. 
Um, swipe cards that you're probably familiar with, and then uh, <clears throat> in your face, we're doing a lot of biometrics to open things, retina scans and uh, fingerprints and, and that sort of thing. And the monitoring isn't just about catching somebody who's uh, taking too long in the bathroom or not coming to work on time. Um, it is about monitoring everything and capturing that data and harvesting it and then using it to speed up the work process. So work that has been standardized, analyzed, automated, and simplified is work that is easier to contract out, outsource, and privatize. So all of these work organization changes have uh, detrimental impacts on uh, workers. Stress, fatigue, increased tension, and potential for violence uh, in the workplace. Loss of skill, job loss, job insecurity, low morale, increased risk of repetitive strain injury, cardiovascular disease, and injury, illness, and death. Very tied to, to health and safety. Um, so our workplace is getting uh, healthier and safer. In fact, in the United States, our data shows that there's been a 62% decline in uh, workplace injuries and illnesses. That's what the data shows. The fatality rate has been about the same, dipped a little bit, um, huge decline. Uh, and why are we seeing that? Well, here's the picture. <coughs> this is uh, just a quick diagram of a work process. You see what the right hand is doing, you see what the left hand is doing. What's the left hand doing compared to the right hand? Right elbows. Not a lot, right? So, what a slouch. Now we're going we're, we're to improve this job. See what we've done? So what's the left hand doing now compared to the right hand? The same. So the employer says, well, this is improvement because, see all the blank spaces for the left hand? That's non-value added. And the goal of lean is to get rid of non-value. Um, so uh, we got rid of that, and we have this. And uh, the employer says this is great because now we can make twice as many widgets. Um, this employer also said that this was an ergonomic improvement uh, because a workload impact is now spread across more body muscles instead of being isolated <laughs> the right on the hand. Um, in fact, the old way of doing the job is a recipe for carpal tunnel syndrome in the right hand. The improved way with continuous improvement is a bilateral carpal tunnel uh, syndrome. Um, so what did this employer do? The injury rate in this workplace starts to skyrocket. The employer has two choices. Choice one is to say, oh my goodness, how we've restructured work is terrible. We're going to have to put in more rest breaks and hire more workers. Yeah, that didn't happen. They went with uh, door number two, choice two. It's called hide the injuries. Hide the injuries. Hard to hide a fatality, but injuries you can hide. So this is an accident report from one of our steel mills. Uh, one of our members was stung by a bee. The question on the employer's accident report form said, what did the affected employee do or not do that contributed to the accident? Why do you feel their actions contributed to the accident? The answer. The employee should have been aware that a bee had landed on his shirt and taken the appropriate steps to remove the bee without being stung. Uh, they tried to discipline the worker. But this is where this behavior-based safety, blame the worker, uh, safety programs, policies, and practices enter. And our workplaces are full of these in the United States. In fact, in the steel workers, over 90% uh, of places where we represent members have one or more of these. The first is the safety incentive program where you get a prize if you don't report. Then there's injury discipline policies. You get uh, discipline or termination if you do report. Um, Post-injury drug testing, the first thing you do when you report your injury is have to pee in a cup. Um, signs uh, tracking, a lost time or reportable injury, supervisor bonuses for uh, when there's low injuries, and then the behavioral safety observation <coughs> programs where somebody is uh, watching and noting down when you perform a safe behavior or uh, commit an unsafe act. Um, so that is the link there. And this is the death spiral we see in the United States of workplace health and safety. You start with lean and mean. 
Um, there's increased hazards then with stress and, and uh, speed up and all kinds of uh, problems that uh, create injuries. Then you have the cover-up, it's called behavioral safety uh, programs. Uh, and then uh, Wall Street and the CEOs are just uh, taking the, the money uh, away and away and away because uh, we're, we're making more and more money for them as we uh, are being destroyed. So all of the trends that I talked about, the standardization and the automation and the monitoring, uh, they all have uh, negative impacts on union strength as well. And so we see the elimination of skilled work where we get uh, our power from, loss of security and bargaining level, leverage, isolation of members, which causes loss of solidarity, divisions between our members, which cause loss of solidarity, loss of jobs, members, and dues, uh, so the drain on union resources that are less and less, and then members loss of faith in the union. Um, so I wanted to just do a special uh, slide for the public sector in the United States. There's a plan. It's called uh, Shrink, Shrift, Shrink, Shift, and Shaft. Um, and Grover Norquist, uh, who's one of our right-wing uh, thinkers, I guess if you want to call it that, said, I simply want to reduce government to the size where I can drag it into the bathroom and drown it in the bathtub. So think about that in terms of what we just heard about TTIP uh, and where regulations are going. Uh, in our public sector, the plan is to shrink and privatize government, shift taxes onto wage earners and turn them into, oh, we need a tax cut. Um, cut services that the majority use and then change whom government works for. And there was that little nasty business in 1776, we won't really talk about it. But since that, um, we've had a government that is supposed to be of the people, by the people, and for the people, and now it's much more of the corporations, by the corporations, and for the corporations. Um, so management has a plan to get us all to go along with their plan. Um, they use fear, along with Kaizen, continuous improvement, problem solving team, Six Sigma, IS, all these kinds of uh, work restructuring <coughs> programs. Um, and that gets uh, the workforce to first accept management's idea, we have to change, or we're going to shut down, or we're going to move, or we're going to do something, uh, and then contribute our ideas and knowledge to management's plan for change. And they use tricks and traps to actually do that. Um, I'm not going to go uh, deep into this. I'll just do a couple. Brainstorming is something that we do in labor education all the time. If management's in the room, brainstorming becomes an anti-union technique. The rules of brainstorming is just throw it out there. And so we may throw out an idea um, that's going to lose Doug his job, right? Because we haven't thought about that. Uh, when we're negotiating our collective agreements, we never do brainstorming with management. We figure out what we want and when we want it, and then we deal with that. And if there's ever something that comes at the table that we're not sure how to respond to, we can usually take a caucus. Uh, when we, we might duke it out right back there, but when we come in in front of management, we're speaking with one voice. In brainstorming, there's no union in the room. Um, the language they use, style words, improvement. I mean, I love the concept of continuous improvement. As a trade union activist, I want our management to continuously improve our wages, our benefits, <laughs> our conditions of work. That's not what they need. So they use smile words. Uh, there's a myth of common goals, and I think the, the rising tide showed that uh, they are able to do very well uh, when, when we are not. Um, if we challenge management's plan, uh, management says, Management rights. We have the right to do that. And I want to say very clearly, management never has the right to maim or mangle or kill workers. It never has the right to destroy our unions. So management comes into this uh, labor management game now with some new weapons and new tools. This is a game we have in the United States. It's called the baseball. Um, and like instead of them showing up with the ball, they're showing up with weaponry. They are renegotiating our workplaces every single day with these changes. Um, but the problem with uh, these uh, renegotiations is we're not sitting at the opposite side of the table. They're just doing it. 
So this is the picture that kind of describes where we're at. The wagon trains are uh, circled, um, and we're saying, can they do that? They're bringing in GPS, can they do that? They're bringing in injury discipline, can they do that? They're bringing in whatever it is, uh, and, and we're just uh, looking at each other saying, can they do that? So this is the schematic of the areas of struggle that we uh, are engaged in now where we are trying to take on management's plan. Um, the first is contract bargaining, the bargaining that we do for our collective agreements. Uh, and uh, there we're a, a fighting force, we're a movement. Um, then when we get our collective agreement, we uh, kind of turn into an enforcement mode. Um, we call it, uh, you know, it's contract enforcement, the employers call it contract avoidance. Um, but in any case, we're, you know, that's, <coughs> we try to use those tools to fight back. There's a third arena, and it's called work process change. And what we see is that management is playing in all of these arenas, but they're putting the bulk of their resources right here. Every day with this renegotiation of the workplace. So this is where their resources are going. The bulk of our resources are going here, um, and there is a uh, real mismatch. So what we are coming into is figuring out how to take on that work process change. If they are renegotiating our workplace every day, then we really need to be in bargaining mode. And so we call the tool or the approach that we're using continuous bargaining continuous bargaining approach. It's not sitting down at the table every day negotiating language. It's using the kinds of things that Ian was talking about to challenge management's plan and build campaigns to take on uh, the employer. So these are the elements that we see of a continuous bargaining approach and they're very similar to what we do when we prepare for bargaining our collective agreement. We do a lot of research and information gathering we communicate with and involve our members because we need a fighting force, not just at contract time, but every day. Um, we develop our proposals and demands. With any new situation that comes in, we say, what do we want? When do we want it? And then we talk about identifying and exercising leverage. And so that could be, again, the description that Ian had was a beautiful description of coming back and saying, no, we're not going to take it, and we are going to take action to prevent you from doing this. Um, we uh, talk about starting small. You just ask the employer, you know, don't do that or do this. And if they do it, that's great. Write your leaflet about how you won. Um, but if they don't, then you start a campaign and think about these elements, and, and we talk about, think about member involving strategies and escalating tactics. So in the workplace where my husband used to work, General Dynamics, it's a shipyard, um, all of a sudden management came in. They were doing a lot of mandatory overtime, we have that, and then the employer said, all right, everybody's going to have to now work mandatory Saturdays. So in addition to the mandatory overtime and work days, everyone's coming in on Saturday. And uh, so the union you know, went and said, we think this is not a good idea for many reasons, uh, including that we have a lot of divorced parents who see their children on weekends and family life and health and safety and everything else. And uh, General Dynamics is a very large employer, did not listen at all. So the next thing was to think about what's the next thing that, uh, that uh, the union could do. They decided to um, do an informational picket line, um, the picket the employer, but not with the workforce, with the children. So the children on the picket line with their crayon signs that says, why won't General Dynamics let me see my daddy? Why won't General Dynamics let me see my mom? Um, in this case, that didn't even have to happen. Word got back um, that uh, this was going to happen, and General Dynamics caved and folded and did not do mandatory Saturdays. So that's the kind of thing. And once our members are involved and engaged, 
they say, what's the next thing we can take on because they are now a movement. Um, the bottom line is if management is renegotiating our workplace every day, we have to be at the table literally or figuratively. Um, and uh, here's our uh, slide about that. If you are not at the table, you will be on the menu. Um, for those who, I'm going to talk more about this in the keynote and a workshop uh, tomorrow, but there's a lot more information uh, on this uh, challenging lean and mean on a website that is www.charlierichardson.org. Um, and uh, I do want to say, um, there's no exact blueprint now for all that we have to do uh, and build to make safe workplaces, clean environments, to bring economic and social justice to our communities. Um, we will make this road by walking it and marching and standing and fighting, uh, by building bridges across our divides, by listening and learning from one another, by remembering that an injury to one is an injury to all, by nurturing our solidarity, by matching <coughs> our strengths to capital's weaknesses, uh, by building uh, our power, because this struggle is ultimately about power. And in the immortal words of the US abolitionist uh, Frederick Douglass, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. Power <coughs> concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. And I'm going to leave you with the final slide, which harkens back to 1929, the start of the Great Depression in the United States, when bankers from Wall Street uh, were jumping from windows, only this is now 85 years later. <laughs>